It's okay, though. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I had to... You're good. Uh, You're good. Get ready. Can we see the shirts? Can we see the shirts? I know my face, yeah. is, my face is covering up the shirts. This is Dr. Stefan, guys. He has his own Twitch channel. He talks a lot about physics. If you like physics, follow him. He's going to be... Wow. Is it going the right direction? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean... Like it, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it reads... Yeah. That looks sweet. That looks sweet. So there's two colors of purple. Oh. Um, because they didn't get the right color on the second one. So they said that they'd reprint them for free. <gasps> the right ones, which means we'll have a few extras that we can give away. I'll take the lavender. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's actually the one that's closest to the Twitch purple. Oh, is it? I, w I yeah. wouldn't. I wouldn't notice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm. I'm fine with either. But hey, if if they're doing something for free and they could get it done, education, yes. Um, and yes, guys, Dr. Stefan, he is Horizon Sci here on Twitch, and he talks a lot about um, physics. He's been popping in my Discord, and he'll say something. Um, and do you usually do that in like a certain channel, or do you do it in the commons? Do you do it in the lecture hall? Uh, I either do it in the commons or in the lecture hall just kind of whatever seems appropriate at the time yeah either way it doesn't matter he can self-promote all he wants because again uh <clears throat> there's not many people doing educational streams here on twitch um so we're trying to we actually set up a discord but we haven't fully launched that yet it might be a good thing to do i don't know if we want to do it before or after twitchcon well i, I figure that we could because we'll have about an hour in the car while we're driving. Mm -hmm. We can kind of hammer out the details. Yep. So remember, guys, uh, I'm, I am going to NASA, but I can't take you guys with me. So that's that's the downside. I still am going, so um, I will give you all the details of how cool it is. That's about all I can do. It was super sweet. That's all that's going to happen. Um, yeah, it was kind of a bummer because I, I gave them plenty of time. I mean, I, I sent them probably something like 20 emails yeah had, had we gone to Ames um, I think I would have been able to get in because I know the people there yeah no it, it it did take a long time Tiger Bear and with $10 thank you so much for the donation love no message at all didn't we use the vacuum belt today oh, uh, yeah? we could I actually have um, shaving cream in there <gasps> wait you have everything in here that we could, we could do it yeah, you can see it in the background. I can see, uh, I can oh, see. Oh, wow, like, I have, like, my whole what right here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot so, of brain in that head. So, um, uh, this morning, I, I cut my hair this morning, and so, <laughs> and so uh, I missed a spot. It was, like, a stripe that went right up the back, and I went to my son's third grade performance, and uh, one of the dads from the soccer team, um, from his soccer team, was like, hey, you've got a mohawk. <laughs> Um, he said, don't worry, I understand, because he cuts his own hair, too. So You're like, I'm a hardcore physics professor. Well, but it was, I mean, it's kind of a wimpy ho mohawk, because it was just, you know, like... It's okay, it's all about subtlety. Else. It's supposed to be subtle. And he noticed. That's all that matters. So... Yeah, no, we could do that. That'd be cool. Um, cause yeah, I, this I, is, I, I, can, I can get rid of some of the shine. Actually, I can't really, because... Because of the lights in here. Fine. Usually when I stream, I open up the window so that I get the sunlight coming in on my face. Yeah, there's, I just put your Twitch channel in here and there's his, uh, so if you guys like physics, a lot of people do like physics. Um, he does a lot of really cool <laughs> stuff. And yeah, I would, I would love to see the shaving cream thing because I see the shaving cream and I see okay. some. Should we do it then? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, hold on. Okay. He's muted. You're muted, I think. Wait, nope, you're okay, good. Cool. You're solid. You're good. You're good. I can hear you now. Okay. It was just taking for so the I, driver. Because I just switched to the, right. to the non- your phone thing right okay so um there we go sweet sweet i'm so excited <laughs> so this is a vacuum jar vacuum bell jar um and what is the, what is the jar represent of a vacuum space it, uh no it's just uh this is just a an air it's a thick walled um, piece of glass and it's pretty thick. I mean, they're, they're not cheap. They're yeah. like a hundred bucks or something like that. And it's got a flat bottom. Um, so, and it's 
designed to withstand pressure. So you suck all the air out and then it's um, sufficiently rigid to prevent um, catastrophic collapse. Roger that. So then the surface of this, this is just a rubber, um, uh, probably a neoprene. So make a good drum practice pad. Um, just a neoprene gasket so that you get a good seal. This is a fairly straightforward thing. It's got a valve right there. Uh huh. And then it's got this plate. And so then this gasket sits on the plate. Got it. Okay. And then, so the part that's missing. This science stream brought to you by T-Mobile. Oh, you guys don't even see that. Is, Hold on. Yeah, my phone uh, actually died earlier today. Oh. And so I didn't spend my afternoon doing what I wanted to be doing. Instead, I spent it getting a, another phone. Okay, so this is a vacuum pump. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a cheap $60 vacuum pump from Walmart. Um, I, I guess it's the same kind of pump that you use if you're checking your air conditioner. Oh. Uh, like checking the pressure in your air conditioner or something like that. Okay, so... Hold on a second. I need to find an outlet. Here we go. The IRL just got so much better, guys. <laughs> okay. So then what else do we need? We need... Oh, I can show you this experiment, too. So this... Is... I can show this experiment. Absolutely. Absolutely. These are called Magdeburg spheres. Are those, are those suction cups? And, and so I, I should point out that these... Uh, these pieces of equipment are actually the reason that I started my Twitch channel in the first place. Um, was to be able to do outreach to very distant um, K through 12 schools mm -hmm. because our the school district where Las Vegas is located is about the size of New Jersey, and so it's not so we can't I can't really justify sending um, undergraduates an hour and a half to visit an elementary school. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so I have this, this hey, Rick. tube. A tube. See it? See a tube. There's a tube. Rubber tube. Kind of long. So then I put it in here. And then I plug the other end into the vacuum pump. Right here. Those are sweet sneakers. Uh, yeah, so my... I'm getting new shoes, too, because... My other shoes uh, started making my knees hurt because I've worn the sole out. That I have the same problem with clothes that my dad has, which is I wear them until they start falling apart. Yeah, me too. Okay. So, I think I think that works. Someone just said that's a sweet hookah. <laughs> so, if, where's the switch? I just snorted. Okay, that works. All right. That works. So, um, I guess I'll use this uh, this mug right here. Uh -huh. I, I don't have a clear plastic. Stream um, also brought to you by U.S. Bank, Nike, and T-Mobile. Yes. Um, let's Trifecta. see. Here's the Aspen Center for Physics. Trifecta. Um, and we'll put some we'll put some Quaker oats out here too. Eat healthy. Okay, so um, this is shaving cream. Um, I'm just gonna put it in here till it uh, kind of fills up the top. You can see kind of. So shaving cream, it's Fluffy. it's basically just a, a fluid where when you squirt the the stuff into it, um, when you when you pull the trigger, it puts air. Like compressed air into the into the solution, and so that's how you get the cream. So this is mostly just air, right? Um, so, so it's it's barely sticking up over the top, but it's there. Yeah, it's like Neil deGrasse Tyson had a complaint about whipped cream in his in his coffee, and they said that that there's something about the person saying it was whipped cream when it really wasn't. And you could tell by the fact that it sank, because in physics, whipped cream wouldn't sink. Okay, so. So here we go. Now I'm gonna turn the. Oh, we're uh, ready. Pump on. We're ready. Oh, I can. Is it is it centered? Oh, pretty it's well? yeah. It's pretty centered. You're you're. Perfect. Okay. Here we go.
Now it takes a little while because we got the biggest jar that we could buy. I was about to say, that was really uneventful. I was so ex Oh, here we go. Yes. I was also adding some dramatic music. Because <laughs> you know how I am. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like one of those snake things that you get at the Fourth of July. Wow, that's more than I expected. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I can have dishes to do after this. I would suspect so. Just a little bit. There goes the sad. <laughs> so now when I uh, stop the pump and let the air back in, the whole thing will collapse. Yeah. So what do you usually tell people about this? When you're, when you're doing this, you're saying what? Why is this oh. happening? Why is this happening, Dr. Stefan? So uh, we're removing all the air. So these bubbles are, the size of the bubble is, is maintained because air pressure is pushing on them. Uh, and then when you remove the air pressure, there's no external force that's keeping the bubble small. So the bubbles will continue to expand until the pressure equalizes. Okay, so now, now it's all popped. And so it should start to, um, now we've broken the, we've put so much internal stress on the foam that each of the little pockets of air um, has overcome the structural integrity of the bubbles themselves. And so now it's starting to disintegrate. Okay, so, so if, I go, if you go turn it off. Ow. Okay, so now if I let the air out, it'll just collapse down. So I need to make sure that I do that last, um, because then it makes a mess. I might have to be able to clean it up. So I'll do my, all my other experiments first, and then do that one last. That was awesome. So that's that one. Uh, so now I can show you. <laughs> so uh, this thing. So these are called Magdeburg spheres. Um, it's a little. They're little hemispheres. There's a little gasket in this inside, and you can you stick them together like this. They're, it's kind of hard to see because it's black. Um, okay, so you stick them together, and then you suck the air out. And then all you have in that case is you have the air from the atmosphere pushing on all sides of this ball. Uh huh. Um, and atmospheric pressure is about 15 pounds per square inch. Mm -hmm. And so the cross-sectional area of this is something like 10 square inches, and it's pushing on both sides. So you'll have air pushing on the right side and on the left side. So that gives you about 300 pounds of uh, force um, pushing these things together, which is the atmosphere squishing it. Wow. Okay, so right now, the air hasn't been removed. So the pressure is the same inside these things as it is outside because um, I haven't removed any of the atmosphere. And then it has this hose. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take this hose and plug it into the thing. There's a little release valve right here. But I'll take this hose, plug it in, turn the vacuum pump on, and we'll see what happens. OK. OK, so here's here's the hose. Someone said Otto Van Gurich? Gurich? Uh, I don't know who it was that uh, originally did this, because Magdeburg is a city in Germany, um, which for everyone who plays Ticket to Ride, the German version of Ticket to Ride has Magdeburg in it. Oh. Wait, we're talking okay. about the, were we talking about the Beatles song? Uh, which Beatles song? Ticket. Maybe. Oh, Ticket to Ride? No, it's a, <laughs> it was Game of the Year, like a board game. Oh, oh okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. 
Here we go. So, so I put these together and then I'm gonna go turn on the pump. Hey, spider him. We're having fun with physics and pressure. What was that? I said we're having fun with physics and pressure. Yeah. Okay, so it's all that's all it takes to empty this out. So I can unhook it. Okay. So now, now I, I recognize that I'm a, an amazing hunk of masculinity <laughs> here. Um, but I can't. There's no way. Oh, well, that was anti <laughs> Science. Maybe, oh, I think I'm supposed to push down the valve as I empty it out. So let's try that again. One more time. I could just say that I did that on my own, but I didn't. So I, I screwed it up. Okay. I was like, you have been working out. <laughs> Too strong. <laughs> Okay, so now it's actually emptying out. Okay. So now let's do the. Okay, so I'm a fine hunk of masculinity mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And it might not look like it, but I actually am putting, trying to get this apart. Um, So that's, uh, they don't come apart. Um, there is one student here who was able to get it apart, um, but he was a national, a junior deadlift champion. Oh. And he, he could only get it apart um, using his back muscles. So pull it, pull it again. Wow. So then if I just let the air back in, and it comes apart. Crazy. So it's, it takes about 300 pounds um, to pull it apart. Just 300. I think it's quite a bit for yeah. going out. Like uh, yeah, so just use it. But he was able to, some other guy was able to do it? Yeah, he put his foot in, in one of these things, and then he basically did a deadlift on it. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, and so there's that one. So the other uh, experiment thing that I have here is uh, so this is actually the demonstration that I adjusted my teaching schedule because um, my class was right after the shooting um, and so I did this lesson for my class which is one on like standing waves Music and science? What was Okay, so I don't oh, know God. if you can hear this. <laughs> yes, we can hear that. A little bit? No, we can hear it. Okay, good. Strum okay, it again. So it's out of tune because I've been taking it, taking it in. Wow, it's really badly out of tune. <laughs> um, so if you just pluck a string, then it's the whole string that vibrates. Right. And so you have something that, um, hold on a second, let me pull this up. Science people are actually musical too. Uh, what am I looking at? It's no. I'm gonna share share my screen for a second. Okay, so. If you have a string that is connected on two ends, uh -huh. then the lowest vibration that you get looks like this. So that's the lowest vibration state. Um, but there's all pop, there's a tower, like a whole family of vibration states. For example, like this one. Okay, where you have a full wavelength inside the and it's all just however it matches, however it lines up at the edges. Mm -hmm. And then, so the next one is gonna have three bumps like this. 
The one after that is going to have four bumps, which, if I did it right, would look like that, and they'd all be the same size. So they're kind of the jump rope modes. Um, <clears throat> and you can force... So normally when you pluck the string, you actually get all harmonics, but the loudest one is the fundamental. It's this one here. Right. Um, but then if you if you force it by like putting your finger in the middle, then this mode can't vibrate and it forces it into this mode here. Roger that. I'm trying to draw with my mouth. You're it's, it, it's, it's impressive. Your paint skills are incredible. So I, I've been practicing. So, and the halfway point is right above the two dots on the fretboard. Uh -huh. um, doesn't really show up. So, but I do that. And then if I put my finger right above the halfway mark, then you get the one octave harmonic. And if I go to one quarter of the distance, which is above the, I think that's the fifth fret, it's an octave higher than that. Sounds perfectly tuned. <laughs> well, this one, well, that, that's one string in tune with itself. And then the way the guitar is tuned is that there's this, the seventh fret, which I think is a, a fifth. Yeah. Um, so the way that the guitar is tuned is that the fifth fret of the lower string should match the seventh fret of the one above it. Well, that was bad. What am I doing? What am I doing? Oh, wait, hold on. No, that was right. So you can tell it's out of tune because it's too high. And so that's so that's how you would tune the guitar. And then also, I used to be able to play it, but I don't think I can anymore. I used to be able to play Red Barchetta, um, but that starts off with all harmonics. Um, <laughs> the beginning of the Rush song, Red Barchetta, is all harmonics, um, where he's just playing different strings. Um, by putting his finger on it and forcing the string to vibrate at a different mode. So you talk um, about string vibrations in science because? Uh, well, it's just wave, it's wave propagation. Right. Um, so we, we did that, we also did musical instruments. So for example, um, let me go back to this, back to my amazing drawing. So when you have um, like a pipe organ or something like that, it, it's actually an open pipe like this and the maximum vibration happens at the ends. We can't see your screen. Oh yeah, how about if I do this properly? Okay, so you have a pipe. The maximum vibration is at the ends of the pipe because that's where it meets the air. And so like, this is the lowest you get in an organ pipe or a trumpet or something like that. And then you can have the next thing would look, would have a wave that's got a different wavelength, which corresponds to a different note. So it looked like this. Mm -hmm. Well, for a trumpet, you have all the valves on there um, because you're putting in waves that are relatively long, but a French horn is super long so pretend that this is a French horn um, unrolled. Uh -huh. And it's super long so that the waves that fit in there, you can, f you go up, it fits higher harmonics. So it would look like this on the inside, which means that when you purse your lips more tightly, um, you go to the next note higher and they're closer together. So uh, if, I, if I go up the harmonics, um, I'm gonna try to make this as loud as I can, but. So that's the first harmonic, second, third, and then they're gonna start getting closer together. And the French horn is designed so that all the harmonics are where the notes are closer together because originally the French horn didn't have any valves and you would adjust the tuning by manipulating your hand inside the bell. So, so this, is, this is like Doppler effect stuff. Um, it's not so much Doppler, it's more of, um, it's, it actually is 
pretty related to quantum mechanics as well. Oh. It's what can you fit inside, um, what waves can you fit inside of what box, a oh. box of this shape. And there's conditions, like the, it has to match up the boundaries um, in order for it to, to be a wave that's a, a solution to the equation. Um, and so you, for example, if the string is tied down at one end, it forces every solution to have a zero value where it's tied, right. where it's tied down. Like there's no vibration at all wherever the string is tied. Um, and so the same thing happens with, um, in quantum mechanics, for example, where the, oh, I've got to put this down so it doesn't break. Um, let me, so like the, uh, electron orbitals. Electron. electron orbitals in quantum mechanics. Uh -huh. uh, so this is what kind of where the electrons live um, around an atom. Will look like this. Uh, let's see, there's there's a fuller, there's a bigger table. Oh, come on, that's lame. Come on, Wikipedia, you're disappointing me. I think if you click on it, and then... Oh, oh, here we go, here we go, this is the one. Oh, okay. So these are all of the different shapes of the electron orbitals. And the reason that they have the shapes that they do is that these are the only waves that will fit. It's, it's basically how many different ways can a three-dimensional object shake? How many different ways can it vibrate that are independent of each other? And... Um, so this is what the electron orbitals look like. And it's exactly the same thing, except that now instead of a one dimensional string that's vibrating between, between two fixed endpoints, it's a three dimensional uh, solid that's vibrating where the center has to remain still and the edges are the only things that can shake or anywhere in between. Okay. Um, so these are basically the three dimensional equivalent of a vibrating string. So, so that's why it was covered in my physics class. Is um, it's basically like how do waves propagate, um, and what, how do they interact with uh, interfaces that they come across? Like, why do we didn't go into it, but it, it's the same kind of thing as like why do waves break when you come to the shore or something like that. Um, so, that is that is actually that really lesson. cool. That, that's my uh, series of demonstrations that I... Yeah, no, and, and that's... So, guys, he does stuff like that. He'll talk about stuff, you know, that, that's a little bit uh, more dense than than denser uh, than what I usually get into. Um, and I had somebody come in my channel and be like, why do you just talk about this kitty stuff? <laughs> People are lovely. Stuff? It's yeah. all amazing stuff. I know. Um, so yeah, if you want more hardcore physics, he's the guy, I'm more of the astronomy stuff and, and basics. And then we build on it. And then I'm like, if I get to a point where it's dark matter, or dark energy, something that actually, I think I told you this, Dr. Stefan, my astronomy professor, as I got up in the higher end astronomy classes, um, I had him for, I think three courses. Um, and he said, I don't, I asked him if I could write a paper on it, on dark energy, um, and actually do, do that. And he said, no, we don't know enough about it. Yeah. There isn't a whole lot that's known. There's and uh, dark matter. Like, I, we know that it's there. Um, yeah. He said, nope. And I'm like, well, I'm not writing a paper. And he's like, you don't need to, you could probably teach this class. So I didn't have to do paper. Nobody knows that though. I had to at least once or twice, but. Um, but yeah, so very, very cool stuff. Um, someone just said in the chat, I don't know if you read that Proteus, uh, I've never considered the atomic level of wavelength. So I really enjoyed that Dr. Stefan. Thank you. Proteus is, uh, a big, he's been here since I started doing the space talk stuff. Day one. <laughs> he's, he's amazing. Um, he's been a supporter for a long time. Um, so I, I guess there, one other quick update and then I can go into dark yeah, matter. Sure. Um, is that I have since made it from the small time stream to the medium time stream. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, and so I have, I got this emote. It was finally approved today. 
Um, and then I, I, I need to fix my third emote because it's kind of lame. But that's one, mind blown. That's my second one. These are all hand drawn by, by me. I have a suggestion on one of them. Yeah. I would change the font color of mind to maybe like a hot green. Yeah, I think I think that's probably a good idea because I found in the dark in mode, the, in the dark mode, that it doesn't show up. And only the cool kids use dark mode, which is probably a lot of a lot of people actually. I use it on everything I possibly can. But those are great. I, I like I like that a lot. Um, and the other one is that a flat Earth? No, it's just a regular Earth. Oh, you know what they call us? I found out that they they have a, a name for us that that people that actually go by the archaic notion that the earth is a globe or a close to a sphere. It's not a perfect sphere, uh -huh. um, but uh, they call us globies. Is that like um, normie? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, the normies? Yep. We're globies. <laughs> so. so just throwing that out there. I just found that I was, I was like, what's a globe? Oh, that's us. Okay. Got it. Um, but yeah, do they call us idiots? Oh no, globies, globies. We're called globies, guys. Yeah. Um. And and I and you know there's some stuff on my Twitter. Um. It's been a lot of shocking things. I've found out that people that I never thought would be flat earthers are flat earthers. Um. And then I was like, hey, gravity. And then I found out that flat earthers, because I don't really know a lot about this whole movement. In fact, I've been denying it for a long time that it's even a movement, but it is. Um. They deny gravity. That's how they get around the whole gravity thing. You know, that, that we have the gravity strongest in, in the, the center, and then it actually kind of goes out and, and, and disperses itself around, and that's how you have a sphere. Um, like, gravity. They, they say that gravity's fake? Well, I, so I understand. I mean, they, I know people can say, like, if we were standing on a platform and the platform was accelerating, then you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, uh, which is true. So we could be standing on a flat disk that is accelerating through space, somehow um, not passing the speed of light. Um, but the challenge that you run into is that you can actually measure gravity. Right. You don't have, to have the Earth to measure gravity. Right. Um, the other thing that's... How does I one think, measure gravity? How do you measure gravity? Yeah. Um, you basically, so this is what I used to do. This was my research. Uh, my second research project was on gravity. Um, you basically have a pendulum, a torsion pendulum. So it's like a dumbbell that's suspended from a, a very thin fiber. And then you take a mass and you move it around in the vicinity of that dumbbell. And um, you can see the dumbbell deflect. Uh, based upon where the mass is located. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm asked, I mean, I, I, these are, cause I've been thinking about it. I want to have a flat earther on here at some point. So, um, but I don't know. I mean, they're throwing out gravity. So, so gravity, we can, we can measure all the properties of gravity. We don't need, we don't need to have the earth to, in order to feel gravity. We can tell, for example, um, we can tell when the sun goes overhead, we can tell when the moon goes overhead. But more than that is you can actually make objects of given mass and demonstrate that gravity behaves exactly the way that, um, well, because it's a low, it's a low density limit. Um, there's no black holes involved in it. You can show that it actually behaves exactly the way that Newton predicts that it should. Um, so gravity, there, there's no, like, these people are capable of um, making a gravitational experiment where they would be able to show that gravity does in fact exist. Um, but if you go beyond that, the one thing that I don't, that I think is hardest to explain after that, um, is, is this, uh, while well, you're looking for it. Thank you. Feats, feats, Leet, uh, for the $5. Appreciate that. No message, no message. Okay. So there's this awesome website that I, someone pointed me to it. I don't remember. Uh, is there negative gravity? There's no negative gravity. Um, all gravity is um, sourced. The thing that causes gravity is energy. Mm -hmm. And as far as we know, there's no negative energy. So all en all object with energy, which includes their mass energy, that E equals MC squared energy, um, will gravitate. And so there's no, since there's no like negative energy, um, 
you can have zero energy, but you can't have uh, ne negative energy. Um, then there's no real anti-gravity in the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me uh, let me pull this up. So there's this website that I found, um, and I think I found it. Someone pointed it out in your um, Discord. So this shows all of the currents, the air currents. Mm -hmm. I think this is ocean currents here, but then you can switch it to to other things. So if I go to air, mm -hmm. oh, it is air. So that's at the surface. Um, wind. Okay, so this should work. And we're still, um, we're still kind of in hurricane season. And so we should be able to see some hurricanes or, or some storms. Okay, so here's a storm in the Northern hemisphere. And this storm is circulating counterclockwise um, because that's the way that the, uh, this is driven by the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force is whenever you have a spinning surface um, or whenever you have a coordinate system that is rotating, um, you get a, one of the consequences of that rotation is that things will feel what's called the Coriolis force. So there are three forces that are, they're called fictitious forces. There are three forces that aren't real if you have a stationary reference frame, but if you have a rotating reference frame, then these three forces come out. And one of them is the Coriolis force. One of them is the, it's called the transverse force because no one has a good name for it. And the third one is uh, the McSunt brother force. Uh, what is it? Oh, the centrifugal force. So the centrifugal force doesn't exist if you, um, if you're in a stationary reference frame, it only exists in a rotating reference frame. Um, so the Coriolis force on the earth is what causes large storms in the Northern hemisphere to rotate counterclockwise. But the, whenever you have something rotating, um, so here's this thing, if it's rotating, if the end of it is rotating this way, so I'm rotating it, uh, I guess it's counterclockwise, hold on. Uh-huh. Okay, I think that should be counterclockwise. Uh... Yeah. No, I screwed up. Okay, yeah. so this is counterclockwise. <laughs> there you go. So I'm rotating counterclockwise. And if I keep the same uh, direction of rotation and I s look at it from the bottom, then it's rotating clockwise. Mm hmm Okay, and so that means that... Um, your frame of when reference. you have a three-dimensional object, when you're looking at a three-dimensional thing from two different directions, uh, the clockwise, clockwise rotation in one hemisphere will correspond to counterclockwise rotation in the other hemisphere. Okay, so then if we go back to this, uh, if the Earth is round, uh -huh. or it doesn't even have to be round, it could be a cylinder. Oh. But if you can look at the Earth from the opposite side, then the storms should rotate in the opposite direction. And so we'll come to the Southern Hemisphere and look for a storm. Uh, this here's, well, wow, there's not many storms in the Southern Hemisphere, but this is one. Yeah, there you go. Okay, and so that one's rotating clockwise. Uh huh. And you can tell it's a storm because the low pressure is the red. Right, right. The other low pressure cell is not gonna, I don't think that's gonna do anything. So here's another one. Um, the high pressure stuff, the air is flowing outwards and the low pressure stuff, it's flowing inwards. But I mean, I guess to some extent people's minds are made up and so there's only so much you can convince them of. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, they, they basically have to convince themselves that um, yes, indeed, this is here and come to grips with with that on their own. Yeah, no, and that's, that's uh, I actually did read about that so i know what you're talking about because <laughs> um, i've been trying to so understand how this could really kick off when we have well it's not like we have other celestial objects that are out there that are also sphere shaped but well yeah i mean and you can see this even in on jupiter so jupiter yeah. has jupiter 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 look at if you look at jupiter um it also has storms, so mm -hmm. a lot. Uh huh. 
yeah, I mean, it's got the one big storm, but it also has all these little Yeah, those storms, little the um, pearl type things, yeah. Towards the bottom. Now, the, the red spot is actually a high pressure center, uh, where on Earth, it's a low pressure center. On Jupiter, it's a high pressure center. So the air in this storm circulate the opposite direction of the way they would on the Earth. But more than that is Jupiter's actually broken up into, it has several jet streams. Earth mm -hmm. has six jet streams and Jupiter has something like, um, it's gotta be an even number. It must have 20, maybe 16 jet streams or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so each of the different colored bands is a jet stream that is rotating relative to the average rotation of the earth, either slightly slower or slightly faster. And so you get um, winds that blow ahead of the rotation of the body or winds that blow backwards relative to the rotation of the body. Um, and that's just because, because Jupiter rotates more rapidly, it breaks it up. Um, the Coriolis force breaks up the atmospheric convection from the equator to the pole, breaks it up into these smaller cells. Um, and creates all these jet streams. So, but I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do for someone whose mind is, is made up. They, they have to figure it out on their own. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the answer for how many jet streams. Yeah, I think you're right about the 16. So I think it's eight cells in above and below yeah. um, the equator. Interesting. Yeah, and it's also smushed. So, Jupiter smushed. So for the smushed. Earth, um, it's fat. Jupiter's fat. It's, it's fat. <laughs> the, the jet streams on the Earth are actually higher in the atmosphere. Um, so I think, I think this is where you can see them the easiest. Is it this So this thing has uh, different elevations. So here's the jet stream that goes across the the northern part of the of the mm -hmm. Earth. Um, so this is the one that makes it because it flows right or left to right, or I guess that's west to east. That's why flights take less time going right um, from California to New York than they do going backwards. Right. Um, and then there's another jet stream <coughs> on the bottom. It's a mirror image on the bottom at the same, roughly the same latitudes. And then there is a third, you know, there's jet streams also near the equator, but apparently they're at a higher, probably at a higher elevation. No. Nope. No. no. Try the thousand. Well, wait, wait. There you go. The ten. So this is way up there. <laughs> this is the lowest pressure. But you can see the jet streams here, even right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so and then there's a there's a cell up at the at the poles as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that is that's how the air circulates on the Earth. I bet Mars is really impressive. Um, Mars is actually kind of weird because uh, a lot of its atmosphere is, its weather is driven by the evaporation of the ice caps. Mm -hmm. um, so when it goes into summer, the southern ice cap evaporates uh, because it's carbon dioxide, so it doesn't have a liquid state. Right. It doesn't have a liquid state at those pressures. Nope. And so it evaporates, and then you get a gigantic wind that blows from the southern hemisphere up to the northern hemisphere, where the winds on the Earth are powered primarily by um, heating up the earth near the equator. Right. So this thing has like ocean currents and all sorts of stuff as well. Um, so the stream also brought to you by uh, NOAA. <laughs> yeah, so this this is like null school. Um, and anyway, I can put the... Here's the website that I down awesome i'll put that in the content of the vod as well i'm i'll just snag that actually real quick so i can make sure to remember to source that um all right let's you want to talk but about speaking of dark matter let's talk about dark matter wait hold on i have, yeah. to, I have to dark matter yes okay do you want to do you want to put it back on so you're not on speaker anymore Maybe? uh yeah hold on yeah. so i'm going to share a different stream And if you guys missed the link, it's okay. I always put that in the comments of the VOD. It'll be in there. Ooh, fancy. So this is um, is a talk that I gave 
at a planetarium that has a lot of the stuff that we need. Um, so I, I guess I'll talk briefly about the evidence that we have for dark matter. Um, so here's some evidence that we have for dark matter. Um, this is gravitational lensing. So what, uh, let me really quickly draw myself a, a uh, pointer. Do you not, can you not show, oh, no, you can't because you're sharing your screen. I got it. So let's make it so I can see it a little better. That's a yellow? No, yellow's not good. Yellow, no bueno. Uh, hot green, red? hot green, hot green. Green? Yeah. Against black, hot green, hot green, and then neon. I need the line to be big, like super thick. Husky. Thick. There you go. Eh, it's not hot green. That's more like a forest green. Okay, I can. Because <laughs> hot, color. yeah, like a, a very. Let's pick a color. It's kind of fluorescent tea. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so. Um, okay, so this is a cluster of galaxies. There's probably something like a thousand or ten thousand galaxies in this cluster. Um, the, we can count up the, we can, we can count up the number of stars that we see in these galaxy clusters by just looking at how bright they are. Um, and we also know roughly the distance to these galaxies because of how they're drifting away from us. Uh, but one of the things that you see is around the edges of this galaxy. So like this region here, there's, um, these arcs. Okay, so there's this arc here. Um, there's another arc here. This one's kind of blue colored. Um, there's these arcs down here. So there's these kind of circular patterns that show up in here. And that's caused by gravitational lensing, that these are very distant galaxies, that the light coming from those galaxies is coming by, is traveling along the site and hits, gets in the vicinity of this cluster of galaxies, and it gets deflected and distorted. And so from that distortion, from the distortion of these different galaxies that are in the distance, we can estimate the mass of these clusters of galaxies, how massive they should be. And it turns out that you only get um, the, the amount of matter that you have to have in these galaxies in order to cause this kind of lensing to happen is much larger than the amount of matter that you have in the stars that's there, that are there. Mm -hmm. um, also, the galaxies in these clusters are moving around each other uh, and they're moving, they're flying by each other at such high rates that the cluster of galaxies should fly apart. Um, but in fact, they stay together. They stay together for billions of years, which means that there also has to be some additional mass that's keeping the galaxy clusters together. So that's some of the evidence that we have for, um, for dark matter. Um, oh, I already have some images drawn here. Um, another thing that we have that shows that dark matter exists is that the farther back in time, the farther away we look from us, um, we can see kind of the history of the universe, the history of the formation of galaxies. And it matches what you would predict if you had more matter than what we can just see on the Earth. So here's a movie that shows the growth of uh, large scale structure, which is like how galaxies are distributed. And so in order to get the growth of large scale structure to match what we observe. So I think the next slide is the observations. So this is what we observe. Each of the points on this figure is a galaxy. And we can see we're at the center and we're looking outwards and we can see how galaxies are distributed across the sky as you go back, basically back in time. And so you match that to these simulations and say, okay, so this is what the galaxy distribution should look like at some time in the distant past. And then as you get closer and closer to, to today, you're getting closer and closer to us um, and our local neighborhood. And so by studying the like the shapes and distributions of galaxies in the very distant universe, um, it tells us how much matter there is uh, that's driving the formation of galaxies. 
And so this is another piece of evidence for the existence of dark matter. Is there any way you can make this like full rotate, screen? Like can how fast the Milky Way rotates and things like that. Can you go full um, screen with this uh, thing? Say that again? Can you go full screen with this? Can I go full screen? With uh, the... I can, but I, I... Yeah, I'll go full screen. I don't know if I can... Or at least with it? that, because I love... I mean, I've, I've talked about that on the stream okay. before. Here we go. It's beautiful. Can't see it. It's not doing full screen. It's not doing it? Uh-uh. Okay. It's probably, the issue is probably that um, it's not recognizing it as a window anymore hmm. when I go full screen. So I could, I don't think this is going to yeah. help. No? So that's, that's the best I can do. Okay. Oh, no. I, it looks like it's getting bigger. Yeah, it is. You're at about 185, 191%. Okay, so this is about, this is as big as I can get. Okay. Um, so that's the growth of large scale structure. Uh huh. Um, it's not that I have a 4.3 screen, it's that I did the presentation on a, for a 4.3 screen. Um, this is an old, relatively old presentation. So that's the, I guess, the evidence for dark matter. But what kind, like what is dark matter is a different question. So there were a few uh, hypotheses that were put out there for what dark matter could be. Uh, one of them is that it could be a massive compact halo object. So it could be like black holes or... Um, just weird. It, it can't be made out of, pro we know that it can't be made out of protons or electrons or neutrons or something like that. It can't be made out of regular matter. It's got to be made out of something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so whatever it is, it could be in the form of relatively large objects like solar mass or, you know, even like, you know, planetary mass. Right. Um, that are flying around in the Milky Way. Or the other option is that they are, uh, microscopic particles. So there were experiments in the 90s and the early 2000s that were looking specifically for uh, the massive compact halo objects. So those are machos. So that's massive compact halo object. Um, and they didn't see them. There's still a window where you could have them if they were something like 10 solar masses, they could still exist. But things heavier than 10 solar masses have been, are known not to be uh, the dark matter. Um, because if there were, if dark matter was these, like, let's pretend that they're black holes, but they could be something else. But if they were like 100 solar mass black holes, then the binary star population, so these are stars that are orbiting each other, mm -hmm. um, the ones that are widely separated wouldn't survive because they would be disrupted by um, encounters with these. 100 solar mass or 1,000 solar mass black holes um, or equivalents. Um, and then at the smaller end, so things that are, say, Earth-sized, those have been excluded as well because if those existed in large quantities, then we'd be able to see their gravitational influence uh, through, we'd be able to see their influence through gravitational lensing of stars in, like, towards the galactic center. So basically, you look towards the galactic center, you wait for these objects, these miniature black hole like objects to pass by and they would cause a distortion in the stars that are uh, near the galactic center and we don't see those and so for there's about 15 years where that was kind of the major effort because that was what people were able to do um, but for the most part these machos have been excluded as at least the dominant part of the dark matter so we can't measure we still can't measure dark matter there's just indirect, let's see, indirect evidence. So this is. Uh, That's Fritz. Pumfrites. Um, because mm -hmm. pumfrites are delicious, especially with Andalus sauce. I call them Fritz. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to use the restroom real quick. So I'm going to okay. let you kind of just take over because you're good to do that right now. So you yeah. can just go on. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just talk to chair for a bit. Yeah, chair, chair's listening. Okay, so uh, we know that, 
So we know that machos can't be the main part of the dark matter. They could be something like 10% of the dark matter, but they can't be 100% of the dark matter. So what that leaves is subatomic particles, um, very small things. And so these are called weakly interacting massive particles. Um, and because scientists are clever, they came up with two uh, acronyms that, um, that are somehow related to each other. <clears throat> um, yeah, I can see the chair. It's, it's an amazing chair. Um, so, so then the question is, if they are these subatomic particles, uh, what, is, what could they be? Like, what could the properties of these subatomic particles be? And then you get into a whole host of possibilities because uh, we know that they can't be standard model particles. They can't be the stuff that makes up protons and neutrons and electrons and things like that. So they have to be something that's not part of the regular repertoire of um, particles that we know about from particle physics experiments. They have to be particles that are outside of our current understanding of physics. And so because they're outside of our current understanding of physics, they don't have any real laboratory constraints on them, then they can be pretty exotic and can have, you know, to some extent the sky is a limit. Uh, but you have this guy. Um, so, so to some extent, the sky is the limit on what you can have. Um, the only imposition is that you can't disrupt cosmology as we know it. Like you can't cause the universe to collapse in on itself because we're here. Um, and so uh, there's a question right there. How do you prove this theory? Um, basically, you suggest, OK, there could be this kind of particle. It could have these kinds of properties. And if it if it does, then it it would show up in these type of laboratory experiments. And then you do those laboratory experiments and look for um, that evidence. Generally speaking, um, what you would like to have happen is to change the standard model of particle physics in a way that solves more than one problem. So there are a handful of problems in our understanding of kind of fundamental particles. Uh, one of them is, um, well, let's see, what's a, what's a good example? Okay, one of them is why do the, why are the relative strengths of the forces so different? Why is the electromagnetic force so strong and then the weak force so weak and the strong force, um, whatever its strength is? Uh, and so to explain this problem with why are the different forces so different, it might be because there's some underlying physical theory that predicts that they should act this way when you're talking about the energies that we can produce here on Earth. And so then you say, okay, here's a theory that forces, um, forces all of these for drives all these forces to the same strength when you're in the early universe, but gives you that what we observe today um, with the forces being so distinct from each other. And if that theory is correct, then you would predict other particles that exist and you'd be able to understand kind of how those particles interact with the stuff that we already know. Um, so this is a good example of this is supersymmetry. So supersymmetry is a theory that's designed to solve some known mysteries in particle physics. And it also provides a candidate particle that could be the dark matter. Um, so that's one example. There's other ones. Supersymmetry is by far the most famous. Um, so there's also uh, string theory is generally supersymmetric as well. So when people talk about string theory, that's usually also considered a supersymmetric theory. Um, so it has a lot of the same properties as supersymmetry. Um, and But there's other things. There's like technicolor. There's Brand's Dickey theory, uh, that's a theory of gravity. There's uh, a Kaluza Klein theory. Um, these are all theories about how, like what could the fundamental nature of particles be? Um, and if fundamentally the universe behaves in a certain way, then we can, um, then that might predict the existence of these particles that could be responsible for the dark matter. Uh, do we live in a computer simulation? That's a good question. Um, after I die, 
I'll be able to uh, I'll be able to tell you. Let's see, matter plus antimatter equals zero. That, Mr. Pumphrey, Monsieur Le Pumphrey, is one of the million dollar questions. Um, uh, it is true that all of those, uh, like doing a, a stream on supersymmetry by itself, doing a stream on Kaluza Klein theory, um, you know, you can you can unpack them over the course of an hour or something like that. So one of the questions that needs to be um, that is not understood is why there's more matter than antimatter. So there's the difference between the amount of matter in the universe and the amount of antimatter in the universe is that for every billion antimatter particles, there was a billion and one matter particles. And we don't know why they, why there's that difference um, because they should be produced in equal quantities. But in fact, we get more matter and so that's why we're made out of regular matter and not out of antimatter. Um, so if you could solve, it's possible that the same thing that gives you dark matter um, might also solve the matter-antimatter asymmetry problem. Um, so for example, the, I can give you an example of the Kaluza-Klein particle. So if you have a, uh, if we live in a universe where there are extra spatial dimensions, so we, we observe three large spatial dimensions. There's up, forward and sideways. Um, but it's possible that at very, at microscopic scales, there are other dimensions that we can't observe. So when people talk about string theory, they usually say string theory is um, like an 11 dimensional universe. Um, and the reason it has to be 11 dimensions is so that certain mathematical conditions can be satisfied. So if the universe did have extra spatial dimensions and they were very, very small, inside those spatial dimensions, you could also put particles that just live inside that dimension, um, or at least they're, uh, where you detect them is inside that dimension. And then you get exactly the same thing as the vibrating string that I had on the guitar, that if you have a wave that's traveling around inside that small dimension, then you're gonna have a fundamental mode and all of the harmonics above it. The fundamental mode is the lowest energy state, and that's going to be the most stable of those um, objects. So, for the case of electron, or for the case of electron orbitals around atoms, the electron lives in those uh, different waveforms. Um, and the same thing would happen here. You have this really small extra dimension, and you put in a particle that that sloshes around in there. You put a wave in there that sloshes around. That the lowest mode you can get because you can't get you can't like destroy it. It has to has to be able to live there. Um, that lowest mode would be a dark matter candidate, and so those are that's a Kaluza Klein particle. Um, if the universe was supersymmetric, so that supersymmetry was the real thing, then each of the regular partners would have a corresponding superpartner. Like there, for each particle that we have in the universe that we know of, there would be a corresponding particle that's the super supersymmetric partner. Um, and those supersymmetric partners could be the dark matter. Um, and then my personal favorite um, particle is called the axion. The axion? Um, the axion is uh, actually, hold on. The axion is named after this yeah. detergent mm -hmm. um the axion dishwasher detergent that you can't buy in the united states anymore so but this is it cleans the axion was called that because it cleans up what's called the strong cp problem which is why the strong force has certain um, characteristics and uh so the research that i did in dark matter was looking specifically at axions so those are the different kinds of particles that have been proposed uh, if, so since machos are essentially excluded as being the, the source of the dark matter, then you have to look at the microscopic level. Can you see my stream? And so so when looking at microscopic particles, um, then you have to turn to particle physics to give you the, both the predictions to test and the, um, I guess, the physical properties of the dark matter particles. Did you see what I put on my stream? I just yes, pulled that, that up. Is, that is the axion. Mm -hmm. 
So, and there are a number of other mysteries that we have in particle physics that haven't been, that are still unknown. So why is there more matter than antimatter? Um, there's, why is, there's the strong CP problem. Why does the strong force have the properties that it does? There is what's the dark matter. There's what's the dark energy that we haven't talked about. Um, there's, um, let's see, what are some other, oh, what causes the neutrino masses to be what they are? Why are the neutrino masses the way that they are? Um, and there's probably three or four more big questions that exist in particle physics. Um, like the, what's the hierarchy, what's the resolution to the hierarchy problem, which is why are the forces, why are the four forces so different from each other? Mm -hmm. um, so all of those things, uh, are still unanswered. Right. Um, uh. and, and the resolution to any one of those questions could give you the dark matter. Um, it's just a matter of how do you design an experiment to see it? And um, how do you know what you've seen once you've found it? And so with dark matter, um, right now there are ways of detecting it is through gravitational lensing. So. That's one of the ways we have to detect it on a macroscopic scale mm -hmm. um, or on a, like a macroscopic scale. Um, so we can see the effects of dark matter on galactic scales. We can also see um, if you want to detect it on smaller scales, then you turn towards. Uh, oh, I got rid of my screen. Um, so, for example, there's the Lux experiment. Someone said maybe there's a time dilation between matter and dark matter, so we don't see the same time state of both. Um, that's probably not true because um, the, the dark matter has to be moving if the dark matter is the kinds of particles that we think they are, you know, of the class of particles that we think they are, mm -hmm. then they're actually moving a lot slower than the regular matter in the universe. Um, and so they're essentially stationary from the point of view of us in, in our stars. Um, so this is the Lux experiment. Uh, hold on. So they, they go, they take this thing, it's in a mine. Um, I think I think this is in the Homestake mine, which is a mine in South Dakota that's been converted into an underground laboratory. Funny story real quick. Uh, yeah. uh, about a month ago, I met two guys that worked in this mine. <laughs> Say that again? I, you met I, a guy that worked in this mine? Two, yeah, two of them that work in this. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah, I know. Because I told them I did, you know, they asked me what I, what I do. It was at a bar. They were like, what do you uh -huh. do for a living? And I was like, I talk about science on Twitch. And they were like, what's Twitch? And I'm like, this is Twitch. <laughs> and then they were like, yeah, well, I'm like, what do you guys do? And they, they told me they were like, we work in this uh, in this mine, the homestake mine. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was pretty, so it's, pretty sweet. So it's there. Um, they're building... Uh, a bunch of neutrino experiments or well, there's a big neutrino experiment that's going in there called Dune. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the plan is that they'll have this, this Lux experiment in there. So in the case of the Lux experiment, um, I think what you do um, is that you, you have this liquid xenon and if a dark matter particle like a wimp comes in and hits the xenon in there, it will, cause the xenon to, um, I have to remember exactly what happens in this, because this is all stuff that came about kind of after I've gravitated towards, <laughs> gravitated uh, towards um, uh, exoplanets. So what do they do? So I think what you do is you look for, uh, light to be emitted by disrupted particles. So a dark matter particle comes in, hits a liquid xenon or hits a xenon atom, 
that xenon atom recoils in a way that uh, that you can detect in a detector that's nearby. Um, I certainly know how they do it in um, in this experiment. So another another way to do it instead of using a liquid thing as your target mass, uh, you have CDMS dark matter. Oh my gosh, I can't spill. So this is CDMS. This is the cryogenic dark matter search. Search, and here they're using crystals. Oh my gosh, there's no pictures. How boring is that? There you go. Okay, so this is um, looking into the dark matter. Um, experiment uh, CDMS. So those little hexagonal hockey puck shaped things. And I know the guy that whose face you can see, uh -huh. he was um, the deputy director of the office that I worked at at Fermilab. At Fermilab. Um, so they're putting in these little hexagonal shaped hockey pucks and they're basically solid or they're pure geranium or ger germanium. Germanium. Geranium is a flower. Germanium. They're pure germanium crystals. And uh, they also have I think it's silicon crystals, and they cool them down uh, very, very cold. So that w if a dark matter particle hits it, it heats them up and changes the electrical resistance of the substance of these crystals. And so they basically just measure the electric, the resistivity of all these things, and look for um, impacts of dark dark matter particles. Um, over the course of several years. And so uh, they haven't seen anything. They've seen a few candidate, um, like candidate events, but there really isn't that much. Uh, if they had seen something, it would have made uh, bigger news. So no news is the existence of just ongoing work. So there are some questions uh, that I want you to answer. Okay, um, let's see. Let's see, there's one here. Um, that was actually banned. Never mind. You, we don't need to. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, so here's one. Uh, how sure are scientists that dark matters actually matter and not a property of space? That, yep. That. Um, so the one of the reasons that we know that it's probably not a property of space is that its effects happen on very different length scales. So if if something's a property of space, then you would expect that it has that it has certain manifestations at certain sizes and different manifest manifestations at different sizes. Um, I, let's see, what's a good way to think about that? Like the properties of ocean waves. Um, you really don't see ocean waves that are like millimeter sized and you don't see ocean waves that are hundreds of kilometers in size. So there's kind of a typical size for disturbances on the surface of the ocean. And so if you have something that's a property of space, you might expect that there's a typical size where its effects are shown. And the fact that we see the effects of dark matter on both galactic scales and on galaxy cluster scales that are a, a hundred or a thousand times larger, um, probably more than a thousand, um, like a thousand to 10,000 times larger. Right. Uh, it doesn't support it doesn't mean that it can't be possible, but it doesn't support the idea that this is just a, some property of space. The fact that it manifests at very, very different sizes. Um, why xenon? Uh, one of the reasons that you choose xenon is because noble gases are harder to contaminate. Um, Do you want to give a you, definition of a noble gas? So the noble gases are like neon, um, xenon, uh, helium, If you look at the periodic table, these are all the different elements. The noble gases are the ones in the column on the far right. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, argon. xenon, and radon. Right. And then there's <laughs> an unknown tonium or something. Um, so one of the reasons that you choose xenon is it has a lot of nuclei in it. It has a lot of protons and neutrons, and those are the those are your target masses. You're actually looking for something hitting the nucleus of the atom, and so the bigger the nucleus, the um, the more 
basically the bigger target you have. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to use radon because radon is radioactive, and so that automatically contaminates your signal. Right. Um, so xenon is a good one. Argon is another good one um, because I think it's more common. So argon is the third most common element, um, certainly in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and uh, it also has, uh, xenon also has the property that it's easy to get it to, its freezing point and boiling point are in a regime where it's easy to get to. It's not expensive to cool something. It's not expensive to cool xenon down to liquefy it. Um, so that's also another reason. Uh, let's see. How does dark matter interact with matter when they are close? So that we don't really know. Um, we don't know uh, because we don't know what kind of particle it is. If it's a particle that interacts through the weak nuclear force, then it would have certain kinds of behavior. If it's a particle that interacts through some other mechanism, then it might be a force that we haven't even discovered yet. It might interact with some, like a fifth force that we don't know what it is. And so it's one of those things where we might, at least we'll have some idea when we see it, what we're looking at, but we don't have a good way of ruling out um, many things. Uh, I heard harnessing dark matter is the key to unlimited energy. Is that true? If so, how? Uh, I don't think that, I don't think dark matter is the solution to our energy problem um, because the density of dark matter where the earth is located is about one dark matter. Well, it's about the equivalent of one proton per cubic meter um, or cubic centimeter. So that's the, there just isn't enough. We're close enough to the center of our galaxy that the ratio of dark matter to regular matter is about equal. Um, and so you don't actually get large quantities of dark matter until you get to galactic sized structures. Um, and there's just no way for us to harness a whole galaxy's worth of dark matter. Right. And um, let's see, bear with me on this because I know nothing about what you're talking about. What problem would be solved by proving the existence of dark matter? Um, so the dark matter is 85% of the matter in the universe is dark matter. So it's basically like knowing our own neighborhood. Um, so it's not going to necessarily uh, cure hunger or, or cure cancer. Um, but it does give us a better understanding of how nature works. And it's fairly, it's rare are the times when having more knowledge is a detriment to you. Um, and so in terms of, I guess, grand, grand scheme of things type uh, motivations, understanding dark matter, dark matter is most of the matter in the universe. And so as we, if we learn more about it, we'll learn more about our place in the universe. So, oh, okay, I always get those mixed up. So there is do more dark matter than there is dark energy. Uh, okay, so now that's with matter. Now, if you're just talking about energy density altogether, then there's about three times as much dark energy as there is dark matter. Okay. But I, dark energy isn't matter, I at was, least not the way we think of it. I was sweating that one because I was like, wait a second. Everything is changing again. Yeah, um, so the easiest ratios to remember, and they're close enough, you know, it's like a close enough for horseshoes and grenades, mm -hmm. is 5%, 25%, and 70%. Okay. For regular dark and energy. Right. And and uh, dark matter, guys, is, is not the repulsive force. Um, it's dark matter is the attractive force. Dark energy is, not, is is the repulsive force, pushes things away. So um, there's someone whose name I can't read. Uh, Musashi yeah. says dark matter accelerates the universe too. It actually depends upon what the dark matter is. It mm -hmm. is possible that the dark matter is um, a type of particle that would both interact gravitationally the way that we see it and over very large distances interact with a repulsive force um, and could simultaneously be the dark matter and the dark energy. 
So I believe, so I, this is a, if I understand correctly, then, then the statement that I'm about to make is plausible. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that um, quintessence is such a thing. It's a type of particle that on small scale, like on the local environment, meaning like within a galaxy, acts as an attractive force. And so it behaves like dark matter. So it basically is dark matter. It would be like an axion. But if the axion had some other force that isn't something that we've detected so far, um, it could interact over large distances in a repulsive way and drive galaxies apart from each other. And so I think that quintessence is an example of something that solves both the dark matter problem and the dark energy problem. Um, but that's not something that's a bit outside my expertise. So someone said there is still too little dark energy to solve the energy crisis. I yeah. So the best, um, the real limit on the amount of energy, like the energy crisis, like where do we actually need to draw the line? It's with how much energy do we get from the sun? Um, so the sun is about a kilowatt per square kilometer. Um, I'm sorry. I lied. It's a kilowatt per square meter which I think is a kilowatt per square meter. So that's a thousand a million. So that's like a megawatt per square kilometer. You can stop sharing your screen if you wanted to, if you wanted yeah. to. Um, I don't know, the periodic table looks better than I do, so <laughs> it's less shiny. <laughs> um, so if you, so it's a kilo, it's a kilowatt per square meter. And so then the question is, okay, now you have the whole surface of the earth. If you take, if you capture all the sunlight that hits the earth, then how much energy do you get? Um, and that's kind of the upper limit on how much energy we can, we need to survive on. We need to survive on the amount of energy we get from the sun or less. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few other reservoirs. Um, there's still geothermal um, that we can capture. Uh, but that's not very much. And there's also, we can also capture energy from the moon's orbit through tides. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, so those are other reservoirs of energy that we can tap, but they're not, they're not nearly the same scale as the amount of energy we get from the sun. Is dark matter everywhere or is it concentrated? Uh, that's a good question. So if, if by everywhere you mean kind of uniformly distributed, uh, the answer is we don't really know. We don't know if it clumps together in, to form like small structures. Like maybe there's Kaluza-Klein stars that are wandering around or Axion stars that are wandering around. Um, so in on a galactic scale, it's distributed, it's spread out all throughout the galaxy. But on a microscopic scale, and by that I mean like interstellar distances and smaller, we don't actually know how it's, how it's distributed. Is dark matter, is matter and dark matter connected by any way like quantum entanglement can, or are they extinguishing each other? Uh, so it's possible that regular matter and dark matter are connected to each other, not necessarily through quantum entanglement in the way that, um, like in the traditional sense of quantum entanglement, but if dark matter is a supersymmetric particle, um, then it's fundamentally connected to the real particles. So for example, if the dark matter is, say, a gravitino, which is a supersymmetric particle, then it's fundamentally connected to the graviton. Um, it has properties that mirror the graviton um, in, in a particular way, um, because that's what supersymmetry does. The supersymmetry says, here's all the particles of the standard model. These are all the particles that we've measured in a laboratory. And now, as of like three years ago, we've measured all of the standard model particles. We know, um, like the standard model is complete in particle physics. Um, it didn't solve all the mysteries that we have. And so we know that there's physics beyond the standard model. Um, but we don't yet know uh, what it is. If supersymmetry is a real thing, 
then the dark matter is probably a a fundamental particle that is like a cousin to uh, some particle in the standard model. And so in that case, it's not really quantum entanglement, but it is there's a quantum mechanical relationship between them. Okay, and then um, is it energy or how's, I don't know, uh, how I think you meant to say, how do you use solar energy and turn it into centrifugal force? Okay, where's this one? Um, it's right under the one saying we need to up your hardware game. <laughs> you need a real microphone. He's in his, he's in his office at, at, at UNLV. <laughs> um, it's Musashi. It's the name you can't read. Just book. look for the name you can't. Well, well, actually, Coolies is also white. You guys, some people still use uh, just normal mode. They don't all, not everybody's on dark mode, guys. Okay, okay so let's see. Uh, is it energy or how, how else do you use solar energy and turn it into... Some... So I don't totally understand that question. Me neither. I... Um, how do you use solar energy and turn it into some... So I think, I th yeah, I think he's saying some trip um, force. So I don't understand that question. I'll have to ask it in parts. Uh, yeah. For me to. to How about it. the next one? No real consideration of plasma cosmology, uh, which so does not away. Heard of plasma cosmology. I don't know what that what that is. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's just I don't I don't know it. Dark and matter and dark matter, not like hot and cold. <laughs> <clears throat> let's think outside the box a little or play devil's advocate black holes are said to evaporate over time that's theory right uh yeah. if they do it in a dirty way and produce dark matter uh that's possible um well okay so whatever comes out of a black hole would have to come out would have to have very 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 small mass because in order for it to evaporate through like hawking radiation or the equivalent of hawking radiation then the separation that the particles get so let's say that you don't produce just a... So the way Hawking radiation works is you produce a, an electron-positron pair near the surface. And uh, one of those particles goes into the black hole, the other one stays outside the black hole and annihilates with something else. And then um, that annihilation produces photons that can escape the black hole because they're traveling at the speed of light. Okay, so now let's say that you want the same process to happen so, and this is actually a, a pretty good uh, idea. So you have, uh, you form a part like a particle antiparticle pair, you form another particle antiparticle pair. The things that stay on the outside of the event horizon collide and produce two new particles that aren't photons. Then the mass of those particles has to be small enough so that they're traveling fast enough to escape the black hole. Um, and so it's, for example, you might imagine being able to create neutrinos through uh, kind of a Hawking radiation type process. Uh, in fact, I guess it almost has to happen because uh, electrons, you can get interactions between electrons that produce neutrinos. Um, and so you can imagine neutrinos coming off of black holes in a way that's similar to Hawking radiation. Um, but is that going to form i don't see how you could make dark matter early enough in the universe through that mechanism for one thing you're, you're going to produce more photons than you do neutrinos just because of the relative strengths of the electromagnetic force versus the weak force um the electromagnetic force is way stronger so photons are going to be by far the dominant uh particle to get spit out so I, i'll say that you could imagine contributing to the dark matter um by having low energy neutrinos coming off of um, in a in a Hawking radiation type process, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that that's going to be enough to get you galaxy formation um, because it would have to happen early in the universe, and Hawking radiation is kind of a late stage process because you have to make the black holes in the first place and then evaporate them. Mm -hmm. Um, and Feeman, I'll get you on that um, because I'm sure there's something. Uh, and, and so someone did a uh, blitz. That's Wikipedia. One of the best sources ever for your knowledge. Um, in particular, plasma cosmology is claimed to provide an alternative explanation for flat rotation curves of spiral galaxies and to do away with the need for dark matter in galaxies. 
Wikipedia. Okay, so I I do know of um, a thing called Tevis, which is the relativistic version of modified Newtonian gravity, where you might be able to explain the rotation curves of galaxies by changing the way the gravitational for force works in different environments. Um, so that's, that is a possibility for explaining, um, or that has been proposed as a way to explain the rotation curves of galaxies, which is one, uh, one piece of evidence for dark matter. Uh, it's not obvious that it explains the, the lensing, the gravitational lensing measurements, and it's not obvious that just because it applies on the scale of a galaxy, that it also applies on the scale of clusters of galaxies. Um, so it's good that people are thinking about these things and pursuing them because uh, you don't want to have orthodoxy in science. Um, you don't want to have like, this is, I mean, it's okay to have standard models, but you always want to be challenging the standard mm -hmm. model. Um, and so you don't want to have basically like the equivalent of a single political party um, because then you don't, you're unaware, you tend to be unaware of your own uh, Bias. The, own draw, the drawbacks within that system. Right. And so people are always developing these other theories um, as a way to force the science to contend with um, other possibilities. Um, someone just said this question is probably irrelevant, but I don't think it's irrelevant at all to the topic. Um, but is there a textbook that Dr. Stefan recommends in regards to orbital dynamics of exoplanets, preferably yes. undergraduate? Yeah, that's not that's not at irrelevant. What, at what level? Um, uh, preferably undergraduate or early graduate level. Uh, so a lot of people might not know, not only does he teach at UNLV, but he has had a major contribution with Kepler missions, the early Kepler missions, and also Dr. Stefan here has worked at Fermilab. Solar System Dynamics. There you go, by C.D. Murray and S.F. Dermott. Um, That's the one. Yeah, this I want I, I want to I want to get you back on to talk about exoplanets uh, too because I want to actually what I want to do is I want to this is a segue a little bit but I want to get in VR and you talk about the planet that I'm looking at in VR. Okay. Some of the KIC, uh, some of those, um, because you were involved in that in the very the very beginning of that whole thing. Uh, not <laughs> quite the beginning, but I got involved. I certainly got involved in Kepler. Oh. Uh, since before it launched. Right. So, um, so I've been, I'll be one decade with Kepler, I think this coming January. That's a long time. <laughs> uh, let's see. So someone, Akuli said, so the particles, I think when we're going back to the Hawking radiation thing, uh, the particles would be going 99.99999, the speed of light or faster than light. If the particle is mass. So particles would be going. I think you might be right. talking about the Hawking so radiation. Particles, you can't get particles to travel faster than light right. um, unless you don't connect your cable properly, and <laughs> um, which is what <laughs> happened in the opera experiment. Right. That's, that's what happened where everybody's like, the, the particle that tra traveled. Yeah, that was, that was a mistake. That was, that was operator error. Uh -huh. So uh, <laughs> if there are particles that travel faster than light, then they're called tachyons. And um, the challenge that you have with tachyons is that you can never get them to travel slower than light. Um, the Lorentz transformation, the transformation from one reference frame to another, if you have a particle that's traveling slower than the speed of light, then no matter how you transform your coordinate system, it will always be going slower than the speed of light. And if you have a particle that's going faster than the speed of light, no matter how you transform your coordinate system, it will always be going faster than the speed of light. So you, uh, once you have a particle going faster than light, you can never um, well, unless we don't understand the universe, you can't get it to travel slower than light. Um, so one thing, uh, so about uh, teaching evolution only, the issue, so here's my take on this, um, and it may come as a bit of a surprise, but I'm, I am a religious person. There are some of us that exist out here. Um, that if you want to replace evolution with another theory and teach it in a science class, it needs to be a scientific theory. And that's where I think there's a lot of people talking past each other, um, especially in the, well, in certain states in the country, for example, is that people are talking past each other because they want uh, explanations for things, but they're not explanations for things that you can test scientifically. And in my mind, if you can't test it scientifically, then it's not science. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so it it doesn't really belong in that class. It doesn't mean it isn't true. Um, I or that it doesn't mean that there aren't things that are. I I believe that there are things that it's possible that there are things that are true that are not scientific. Um, meaning that there are things that can be true that, that there's no way to design an experiment to verify their truth. Um, it's just because we map science onto mathematics, um, it's not obvious to me that mathematics is a language that can express everything that's true. Um, in fact, Gödel's theorem, um, there's a book called Gödel Escher Bach that's a very good book. Um, it's, it's actually the book that got me into nonfiction. <clears throat> um, so Gödel Escher Bach. Um, so Gödel Escherbach, Gödel's theorem basically says that whenever you have a mathematical formalism that is sufficiently powerful, then you can make statements that are neither true nor false within that formalism. Um, so for example, the English language is sufficiently um, complicated or sufficiently uh, robust that you can make sentences that don't make sense. For example, um, this sentence has, let's see, has exactly three errors. <clears throat> so this sentence has exactly three errors. Is that true or false? Uh, if it's true, it, it can't be true because there's only two mistakes in it. Right. But that means that it's false, in which case it has three errors. Um, <laughs> and so English is a, is a sentence, it's a formalism that's sufficiently, in any language, any you know, human language, is sufficiently complicated that you can say things that are technically correct, but are also, um, or like that are kind of technically ambiguous. Well, wait, wait, we have someone that says, okay, because I've actually encountered this when I was like, no, there's, you know, constant. So it's guttle? Pronounce guttle? Um, in O oh, and you pronounce it like uh and burn. Uh yeah. Guttle. Er Guttle. G Burr. Guttle. Okay. <laughs> Someone said that the issue here is that C um referring to the speed of light. Constant okay, let is me not see. where's that one? It's a big one. Um the issue here. Oh, okay. Because I've had this the on my, is that C my stream. Is not real is not either. C is the constant speed of light in a vacuum. The problem is the vacuum doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. If it did, once you put a photon in a longer vacuum, so the vac value falls apart from the get-go. On top of that, some of the people are starting to think that the photon might also have a mass. Okay, so there are tests of, to, to, there are measurements of the photon mass. Let me say it again. There are experiments designed to measure the photon mass, um, which is good. That's exactly the kind of experiment you want. Mm -hmm. You want to have, you want to say, you know, our quantum mechanics relies on the photon being massless, and then you want to test that because that's one of the fundamental things on which our modern science relies. And so, if the mass if the mass of the photon happened to be ten to the minus sixty four electron volts or something like that, if you found it, then you'd say, "Oh, okay, that changes the following things." It means that it's still effectively massless in terms of its macroscopic properties, um, because if it if it wasn't approximately massless, then a whole lot of things would stop working. Um, like the GPS system would stop working. Um, but it doesn't mean that it has exactly zero mass. And so it's something worth testing because then you say, oh, here's where the assumption breaks down. And then you can expand your theory to correct for it. Um, he said on top of that, some people are starting to think that a photon might have mass. The reason for reason being if a photon was massless, you couldn't block it with other matter. Photons should go right through you if they were massless. Um, so that's that's not the reason that I know of that people are testing for the pho photon being massive, like having mass. Um, people have been testing for looking for photon mass basically for the last hundred years. Um, the reason, but the photon doesn't couple to mass. The photon couples to the electric field or, or to the electric charge. And so um, I don't see how, um, how it would pass through matter. Because it, it, it's basically the photon, it's affected by gravity, but it's not, 
it, do, it doesn't get blocked by matter. It gets blocked by electric charge. Um, and so as long as the electric charge is there, then the photon will interact with it. And that, that's actually a fundamental uh, property of quantum mechanics is that the, the photon exists because, so here's a great sentence. Um, so write this down uh, for the next time you go on a date or you go to a party and you want to impress somebody. Get ready to write this uh, down. The photon exists because of local phase invariance of the quantum wave function. Wow. Say that again. The photon exists because of local phase invariance of the quantum wave function. Nice. What that means is that, um, so all particles, all fundamental particles are actually uh, have wave-like properties. And you don't want physics to depend upon where you're standing on the wave. You want to have physics depend upon the average behavior of the property or average behavior of the wave. Um, and so when you say, physics can't depend upon where on the wave I'm standing, but rather on the property of the wave in general, it forces you to make a correction to the equation that dictates how the wave evolves with time. And the correction that you make is the one that says there's an electric field and there's an electric charge. Um, and the photon is what uh, couples to that electric charge. And so that's, uh, it's actually a fundamental property of quantum mechanics that electromagnetism is a force. Um, and so, uh, it's one of the four. So that's, yeah, so that's, uh, so that's related to that discussion. Uh, one other thing I'll say about that discussion about speed of light is that for this, for the case of relativity, um, it doesn't actually have to be light. That's the speed rather you could have any time you impose any speed limit on the universe, you'll get relativity. Um, it just so happens that. Einstein chose the speed of light to be the speed limit that was imposed so that he could preserve the properties of electromagnetism. But it may be that the universe has some other speed that it wants to impose on us that's different from the speed of light, in which case the, um, the transformation that you make when you go from one reference frame to another would just have a different value for the maximum speed. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I was trying to make a joke and then I, I added the wrong person. I don't know. Um, I tried to explain how a packet traverses, traverses a router and got blank looks. If I said that on a date, I think they'd just up and leave. Uh, so do uh, photons travel for infinity or do they get absorbed by something they pass or hit or they evaporate, so to speak? So the number of photons in the universe is, is not fixed. Um, you can you can take one photon and make two out of it, and you can take two photons and make one out of it. Um, so you can always the number of photons is not a fixed quantity, um, and so they can be absorbed. Um, they do they I don't think evaporation is the right word for it. They don't have a lifetime. They live if they're not if they don't hit anything, they live forever. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not absorbed by something. Uh, so what can happen is they can be stored. The energy that they have can be stored. Uh -huh. And that's what atoms do, is you have an atom with an electron in it. When it absorbs an, a photon, it will move the electron to some other energy state. And it's basically like acting like a battery, like a photon right. battery. And then when the electron cascades back down or falls back down to the ground state, it re-emits re um, a photon with the same amount of energy. You just went into a little bit of cosmology there. Let's see. <laughs> uh, Invictus, be respectful, please, or I will kick you out. And that might be abusing my power, but this is my house. So, you know, I just, I really just don't like your face. Um, so, sorry, he was testing my mods. That was actually what okay. happened there. Um, uh, let's see. Do we, maybe there's no such thing as a particle in optical manners. How do we imagine or different thingies thingies hey. is a good word thingies is a very scientific word hey visions um, okay can you have different things that are transparent to each other let's see it's just about interaction of different things that can be transparent to each other defined by theories we know is there anything okay. in space you so want me to exactly, throw up i can throw up some a, space that's actually stuff. a good insight uh this is from monsieur le pomfrit 
um, which uh, incidentally, pomfrets, not only are they very good with Andalus sauce, but they're also very good with uh, mussels. I don't even know what that is. What is a pomfrets? You're, you're sounding rice. more sophisticated every time you say it. Like I, I hear the, uh, an accent come out every time you say it. Oh, so, so pomfrets is the French word for French fries. Oh. Oh. So pom is an apple, but pom de terre is a potato. And so it's fried potatoes. Someone just said that the hell photons have momentum. Yes, photons photons have momentum, uh, and they have energy. Um, okay, so pump frites. Uh, that's that's exactly right. That if you have a particle, so particles can only interact with other particles that are painted with the same charges. So, for example, if you have here's a whole bunch of particles, and I paint electric charge on them then they can see each other and they can interact with each other. Um, if you paint mass on them or energy on them, then they can interact gravitationally. But if we ignore gravity, because the gravitational attraction between two small particles is, is minuscule. Um, but if you say you invent a new force, uh, the way that it would fit into the quantum mechanical, like a quantum mechanical description is that you'd say, here's a new force. Here's the charge associated with that force. And these are the particles that are painted with that charge, that have that charge on them. And uh, then any particle that has that charge or has that paint on it would be able to interact with any other particle that had that same paint or the same family of paints. Um, but if they didn't have that paint, then they're basically camouflaged um, from each other and they wouldn't interact at all. They would just uh, pass through each other as though they didn't exist. So that's, that's actually a, a good way to think about it, is that any two particles are going to be transparent to each other unless they're both painted with the charge that's associated with a particular force. And then if they're both painted with that charge, then uh, they will interact with the force, with that force. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is why I don't go into this stuff, because there's no way I could talk about this with any level of expertise, and I'd be lying to you guys left and right. Can dark matter coexist with the big rip? Yes, because the big rip is a property of the dark energy and not a property of the dark matter. Um, so if the dark energy has a particular expansion property, then it could result in eventually with the universe basically pulling itself apart, pulling itself apart at the subatomic level. The acceleration of the universe would be so great that in the distant future, atoms would be stripped apart. So um, because um, the space between the, the the space between the protons and the space between the quarks within the proton would be expanding faster than they can correct for them. So I did I did have Proteus it it got moved up um but Proteus asked if he could ask a theoretical or hypothetical one of those I think it might have been hypothetical I don't know Proteus you can yell at me if I'm wrong uh warp drive question. Okay, where are we? I, I it it was way Way up there, um. So don't oh. try to don't even try to scroll. Don't even try. I wouldn't oh, I'll try. Search it. for it. What is it? Well, Give me a word. Well, let's let he can ask it again now because we have the stream delay, so we can just sit here and just awkwardly pause for like fifteen seconds, and it will be there. Um. But guys, I don't want to keep him too much longer, um, because I still want to play my puzzle game too. But yeah. And um, I, have, I have to pack for TwitchCon. Yeah. I'm leaving um, Are you leaving? Monday. Oh, you're leaving Monday? Yeah, I have. I speak at UCLA, then I speak at Cal State Northridge, and then and then it's Thursday. Oh. Uh, I can't say what, I don't know what the ablobliere, that's probably a French word too, ablobliere. Ablobliere. Drive. drive. Yeah, I don't even know. That sounds like you sneezed. All over your keyboard. I do believe there's a way. I maybe maybe. <laughs> um. Oh wait wait wait. Let's see. I meant if photons get absorbed, do they transfer their momentum? And Felmall, who is my roommate, uh, who also is a physics major, on top of other things, um, said yes. Uh, and yeah, so he'll. Doctor Stefan's going to be on the panel with me, guys, at TwitchCon. So he'll be there and repping our twitch.edu. Can I see that? Can we show the shirts again? Yeah. Just because I that, those actually look really good. I'm very, very happy. Um, 
and he has his own stream and he talks about these kind of physics things. So if you guys, I don't really get this. Look at how cool that is. Um, those are so, awesome. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to give away some of these things uh -huh. um, at the, because I, I, I got four extra shirts. Um, and then we're going to get an additional like six because they printed it on the wrong. So the this company that I printed them with is actually the parents of one of the physics majors, one of the graduate students here. Oh. They have a t-shirt print shop. And hmm. so if you're ever in Las Vegas, um, that's the print shop to go with. It's uh, all sport printing. After you're done drinking at all the bars, um, go to the print shop, get a t-shirt. Um, do you play games? <laughs> I'll let you, I'll let you talk about your Metroid stuff. Um, so I, the games that I play on a, I don't play as much as I, okay. So I play Clash Royale, um, probably the most because you can play it when you're sitting on the corner. Um, <laughs> my favorite game of all time is the greatest game of all time. That's Super Metroid. Um, the... If I am looking for a challenge and I have a day to burn, um, then I might play StarCraft. Uh, I like StarCraft II. Mm -hmm. I play Terran on StarCraft II. Um, the but you I've won made something. To, I, I think I've, I was competing regularly against uh, Diamond players, but that was, uh, it's been probably almost eight months, maybe a year since the last time I played it. But the speed run thing with, with Super Metroid? Yeah, so with Super Metroid, um, that's the game that I play at nights after everybody goes to bed and I'll, but I, so I was the ninth fastest super Metroid player, uh, within, so a few months after super Metroid came out, it came out in 1994, um, Nintendo power magazine announced a competition to, for a speed run of super Metroid. And I was the ninth fastest finisher. Um, the game has since been figured out, um, and I'm no longer even remotely close to the ninth fastest finisher. Um, I, in fact, I'm not even, I, I barely figured out mock ball just a couple months ago. Um, but so that's, those are the games that I played. Although I did decide um, in my stream earlier this week that I will probably not stream any of my gameplay. Um, you can leave that up to me because I don't, I'm so bad at video games. Uh -huh. So I, I think, I think what I'm planning, what I'm going to do, I mean, I Streaming can imagine, them. I'm not going to never say never. So it's possible, but I'm not, I'm certainly not going to make it a regular part of, of what I do just because um, my time's kind of limited. And so I want to make sure that my. Yeah. Uh, you come in, you come into my chat and hang out while I'm trying to trying to multitask horribly on um, someone said what's your pb <laughs> baking the book said what's your pb is that uh, a starcraft for, reference for uh for super metroid or super uh, my metroid. personal best now this is oh, game God. time not real time so this is like according to the game clock uh i've made it i finally made it under an hour um i've made it to like 50 58 minutes or something like that that's game time um i'm i'm not I'm not really interested in anyway. So that that's the best I do. I've I've done, um, which is kind of far from the record. Go to uh, I did actually do quite well on Dr. Mario, um, but my version of Dr. Mario doesn't let you finish the game. Um, normally, when you finish the 25th level, uh, it ends the game, but the version that I have repeats the 25th level over and over again. Um, Someone said my, well, some, wait, 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 wait. Go to Las Vegas, come back with a uh, twitch.edu shirt. Absolutely. Um, and someone famous in Japan said, hi, dark matter is just non-visible mass. <laughs> um, yes, that, that's basically what it is. It's, it's mass that doesn't have any kind of charge painted on it that we know of. And then uh, how do you prepare your oats? This stream is brought to you by, if you, again, uh, T-Mobile and Quaker Oats and generic shaving cream and Nike sneakers that oh, are going to... Oh, not generic. It's, it's Barbasol. Oh, it's Barbasol. Oh, my it God. It's Barbasol. shaving cream <sighs> that I had. A... That was a close one. 
Thank and, you. and the Aspen Center for Physics. And, uh, <laughs> um, so he's he's a regular on my stream, guys. Uh, we we have him. I, I want to get him for Exoplanet Talk again because that was really good. I know that some of that's on my YouTube, but I'd like to do the VR stuff with Space Engine and him go over some of his favorite uh, Kepler planets, um, especially ones that he holds close to his heart. Um, is the doctor a Rick and Morty fan? I think we get asked this. At least, yeah. I, I don't know if I've. I, I don't think I've ever seen it. Now, I, I was thinking of having, um, like, putting a poster back here that said, "What would Samus do?" But. Uh, <laughs> um, um, and, what asteroid passed by us? What? Uh, that I don't know. I, I usually find out about those things when my students ask me about it. Yeah, because that's usually, that's, uh, yep. Um, do you guys have a Patreon account? Well, I'm, I'm partnered because of science. Um, I'm a partnered streamer now, and there's a sub sale going on for, like, the next, like, week. Um, he just recently, did you, did you do the, the, um, just, did you, because you yeah, got emails. So I, yeah, I, I, I found out what the legal limitations are um so i have to declare a conflict of interest with my university but otherwise they're okay with me moving up so i've moved up from small time streamer to mm -hmm. medium time streamer so you're an uh, affiliate which means i have three emotes now um you're an affiliate and, yeah so i'm an affiliate i even have some subscribe in fact uh Varikinov was the my first subscriber whoa yeah, so um, on the panel, we have uh, me, Dr. Stefan, and, well, I'll put myself last. Dr. Stefan, Inertia TV. Uh, she's a forensic anthropologist. That's what her, her studies are right now. Um, and she'll be talking on the panel, and then I, I am also on the panel. Um, oh, I understand. Yeah, so there's a subscribe stuff. Um, but if you go to, I think we just linked the panel stuff again um it's going to be on sunday and then after that we're actually going to go uh hang out i think we're going to a bar after that right yeah i don't know what um what it's called <laughs> I, I so i'll yeah. get myself a, a sprite and <laughs> and watch everyone around me have a good time <laughs> right and that's what he usually does he vicariously lives through everybody else and the things like that so usually um, we have him on here. He's always in the chat. And if I ever have a question that I'm like stumbling on, um, he's a great point of reference, but he does stream himself as, as well. And so he, you had to declare a conflict of, uh, interest, uh, basically saying well, you're not representing you and you and LV have this. So universities often encourage their, um, faculty members to spawn businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like, let's say that I was working in material science and I develop, or even chemistry, and I develop a new drug or a new, um, like, fabrication technique or something like that. Then uh, the normal mode of operation is that you, I, as me as a professor, would patent it, spawn off a business, and then the university shares in some of the royalties from the patent. Um, and then I get the remainder of it and I can kind of run this business. And so, and this is true for pretty much any university that as if professors develop some intellectual property that they can monetize, it's good for the university because it, for a number of reasons. And so they, it's not something that, that they discourage. Right. Um, it's just something that they have a procedure. When you do this, then you need to fill out this piece of paperwork that tells us that you're doing it. Oh, okay. And so once I found that out, um, then I can fill out my conflict of interest form and um, there's no problem with me. Um, and the main thing is that I, for education content on Twitch, I think it it's better to have people that are visible in that they've climbed up the hierarchy of the, tw like the Twitch hierarchy um, in terms of, you know, getting partnered and so forth. And so that's the main reason that I went ahead and, and bit the bullet to do that was so that because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try to grow something and then not try to be part of the growth. Right. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kind of like putting this between, I'm, I'm trying to make it so it can, 
<laughs> Wait one second. Hold on. This is a lot better. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, yeah, this is where this is all going to be. And he's actually the moderator. What does that even mean? Like you're kind of leading it? Everything that I'm not with my scientific discussions um, on here? It's more – so I think the idea is that uh, – so you propose to do a session – and but that doesn't mean that you propose to be so they're separating um the so like for example i could do i want to do a session of all nba basketball players who stream on twitch and so i propose to do that and i show that i have and then i can bring in like real nba basketball players who stream on twitch and then they would be the panel and i would be off to the side kind of running things um i wasn't expecting them to separate it like that um, Can I not be one of the NBA people that at all ever said that flat earth was a thing? <laughs> it just goes <laughs> to show that you can graduate from college <laughs> and without, um, well, and that's one of the things I tell my students, um, like, look, the world needs people that are, that have technical skills. And also the world needs people who understand that life is complicated. Um, huh. because the life and things are complicated. Because there's a lot of there's kind of two schools of thought about what a university is for, and one of them I think is just patent patently ridiculous, but it's embraced by many departments. Um, one of them, so the two basic schools of thought are that the university is there to um, so that you can change the world, and the other one is the university is there so you can understand the world. Um, and I'm very much in the latter category. I think that the university is there to help you understand that the world is very complicated. And that if, you're, if you have designs to change the world, you need to understand it um, well enough that you don't break it in your efforts. Right. And, and so in my intro to astronomy class, um, and this is actually, I mean, I'm basically the, one of the demos that I figured that I could do is to just say, here's a cell phone. Here's a screwdriver, make it better. Um, and if the only tool that you have is a screwdriver and the only knowledge you have is how to push the buttons on the flat screen of the cell phone, then you're very much more likely to make the cell phone worse than to make it better. Um, and I think that as part of my job, and in fact, my, my own perception of what my, what my contribution to society will be has been changed significantly over the last couple of years, especially with what's happening in college campuses, um, that it's really important for people to understand how to think and how to come up with, um, how to properly formulate their own opinions mm -hmm. and to go straight to the source. Because um, especially with the media now, they're, they're driven, the media is driven by clicks and not by content. Right. And so, um, and it's driving, and so people, you know, typically just read the headlines. And so it's causing a lot of disconnect between like reality mm -hmm. and, um, and perception. That actually goes right in with what, uh, Mox Moss just said. Does anyone know where this flat earth resurgence is coming from? And that, that would feed it exactly what he just said there. There's a lot of yeah, stuff out it, there. I think it's coming from people just not understanding, yeah. like there's a distrust of science. And part of it is that people don't want it, it can be hard. The truth can be a bitter pill to swallow, right? It, the truth does not care. It, it does not care right. about anything. It, Flat earths up in the chat, please. Yeah. Truth does not so, care, nor does and, the universe. You know, people, um, and this runs into things with, you know, it doesn't affect physics as much right now, but that doesn't mean that it won't be coming for it. Um, but there's they're gonna there get you guys movements to censor results in like biology and stuff like that um because they don't map they don't match with um people's political ideologies and it's i think it's uh that's not that should not be um and, and you know there's stuff like that with other things too you know like some people's political ideologies don't allow them to conceive of climate change as being a thing right um yeah, and, and so I talk. It's I talk in from both ends, right? Right. I talk a lot about that. Um, you know, saying like, guys, it's not. There's no like real political bias that's at all. If if you're talking about this kind of stuff, um, that just can't. That doesn't doesn't feed into it. Again, like the Earth doesn't really care about who's on what side of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and and like what you, I guess I've I've been trying to formulate like what actually 
is what actually drives political motivations and things like that, um, and political philosophies. Um, and I think that it's a, you know, as you learn more things, you have a, a range of different, um, you'd call them axes in a, in a vector space, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, here, here's, a, here's a good, I did this with my um, students in, at church, actually. Um, now, the, uh, real quick, guys, like this is kind of what we're trying to do with the whole educational panel thing at Twitch is right now I'm in the IRL section. And as much as this is very IRL because it's physics and space and space talk, I usually talk about astronomy and stuff. Um, he's the physics guy and, and gets it more in depth with that. Um, but we want to be able to have like a, a section on Twitch where if people are well, well learned or knowledgeable um, and, and you know, whether it be like philosophy, architecture, um, engineering, um, things like that, and have a section. So I'm not chilling in the IRL because that's a little uncomfortable sometimes, but. Um, yeah, because I need to get, I need, my camera's too low. I need to have a camera that's up a little bit higher um, for it to be a real good IRL stream. Right, yeah, yours is a little too low. Um, I would suggest more deep V-necks, but I, uh, yeah, so kind of want to, uh, yeah, that's what we're trying to do is actually have an educational section, just like we have creative IRL, um, we're, we're campaigning for something like that. And it's really going to actually come from the, the push of you guys. If you guys like this content, I know a lot of people actually are, you know, being jerks tonight, but that's going to happen. It's Twitch. Um, uh, I don't know. it's whatever. So, so I, what I was saying is that um, I, I can claim, and I actually do claim, that these two shapes are the same. Um, that Clearly. the shape over here is the same as the shape over here. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to do this, but it takes people, who, it takes people talking from uh, all different directions, all different points of view, to actually come up with the result that this is actually a cylinder um, being viewed from two different directions. And I think life and society are sufficiently complicated that rather than, you know, like a cell phone, you could probably get a few hundred engineers and give them uh, five to 10 years and they could develop a cell phone roughly from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, but very smart people have been thinking for centuries about how society should function and they still haven't resolved it. Right. Um, which is an indication that it's actually much, much more complicated than the typical college student might want to believe. Um, and, uh, and so the importance of having different viewpoints is it's what allows you to flesh out the full scope of what you're grappling with. Um, so anyway, that, that's my own, uh, philosophy on. No, that's mine too. I, I, I think, I think with that kind of stuff and, and it would be awesome. Like if people, um, you know, majored in political science or, stuff like that if they could have now again i've always said this like you need probably good moderators again this is twitch people are going to be retarded stupid but people are going to be, be people they're going to be people and that's going to happen so um but yeah i i would i that's why we're pushing for something like this um and and i I've, I've talked to a few people um a guy with a really loud muffler um and uh, so that that's kind of what we're going for, and we're going to have that panel, um, and we'll be there. We're going to go have drinks, and he's going to have a Sprite, and um, I'm going to be asking him how his Sprite tastes, tastes all night. Delicious. Um, <laughs> Makes you feel alive. <clears throat> right. Um, so, yeah, and I, I talk about astronomy, and then I also play games. I'm, I'm a mixture. Um, right now I'm playing a lot of games because I'm recovering from being sick, and my brain's not as shiny as his head. Yeah, I, I, I totally, yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, so, yeah. well, I, I, should, I should let you go and, uh, and get back to well, your, thank recovery, you. your recovery game. <laughs> but this was fun. Uh, dark, yes. dark Matter, Dark Energy is, a, is yes. fun. I like, I like um, this stuff. Right, and he's obviously, you guys can tell, he's funny, and he takes, he's, he's, we have a good rapport. So when I get there, we're going to go to NASA um, I will be landing actually on Thursday, so I'll be getting into that area in LAX uh, on Thursday. But 
Uh, and then we go to NASA and I'll just be able to tell you guys, maybe, I don't know if they'll let me take like a sweet selfie. Maybe, maybe we could get a selfie. I don't know if we can or not. Maybe if I show him and I'm like, Hey NASA, it's just a selfie, but I can't take you guys with me. I'm sorry. I can't take you guys with me. Uh, no media representative is going to be there and that's okay. That's fine. So I'm going to go to NASA and then, then down to Long Beach. Um, so, uh, yes. And now you're speaking French. Merci, Monsieur Le... You can say the rest of that. I can't say that. Or I guess it should be Le Pomfret. Um, merci, Monsieur Le Pomfret. Pomfret. Thank you, Mr. The French Fries. Take your selfie stick. That's a, I thought that was a putter. I thought that was used for putting. <laughs> it could have a, a selfie stick that doubles as a putter. Though. That's what I usually use it for. I got one for my sister, and I was like, I don't know what to do with this. What is this? Um... But yeah, so he's he's a uh, he's always in my stream. So if you guys see him in here, and also he does stream, and I'm gonna get back to playing games. So we're not done yet, guys. But thank you so much for your time, as yep, always. Absolutely, we'll talk to you later. Yep. We'll see you in a uh, few days. Six days, right? Oh gosh. All right. Okay. It'll see you cool. later. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. He's awesome, guys. Um, and he has a sense of humor, <clears throat> like as you guys noticed. Um. He does have a sense of humor. So I'm going to just switch over. I'm not I'm not done yet. I hope you guys like him. I like him. Um <laughs> He is awesome. He's wonderful. Um so yeah, that's kind of what we do here. I I talk more about space. 